in our scripture. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood self-condemned. For until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Thank you. You may be seated. So for Jill and Wayne, we're going through the book of Galatians, and I have a habit of getting started on a book and just going through whatever comes next. We're in the second half of the second chapter. The problem with that is if you get something hard to do, you still have to handle it. And you can't do your favorite topics all the time. You just have to deal with whatever comes next. So, but before we get into the Galatians, and we had some history last week in Galatians that um, there was a big kind of a argument between Paul and the apostles on the circumcision part of the gospel. Paul said, you're saved by faith, faith alone. And the, the Jews thought, or some of the Jews, called Judaizers, said, we got to have circumcision. You have to be circumcised to be a Christian. And Paul didn't think that was correct. So he had to go to Jerusalem and get that straightened out. So there's a backup to where we are today is in Acts chapter 10 and 11, if you want to follow along, because I'm going to kind of run through it real quick is the story of Peter. Peter was in Caesarea, and he was on a rooftop taking a nap, and he had a dream, or a, a vision, I guess. It's not a dream, it's called a trance. He fell into a trance. And in his trance, there was these sheets, and actually Kevin and I were talking about this a week or so ago. He was in this trance, and a sheet came down from heaven with all kinds of animals in it. And the sheet came down, and God said, kill and eat. And Peter said, no, no, I can't kill and eat these animals. They're not clean. And, and God says, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. And Peter's going, wait a minute. I've been a Jew all my life, and Jews have certain dietary restrictions. And you're saying... I should eat this stuff. There's something wrong with here. And the same thing happened three times. The sheep would come down, kill and eat, and Peter would say, no, I can't do that. And God would say, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. So Peter woke up and found out there were some men down there to come to get him. And he didn't know anything about this. These men were coming to get him. And uh, he's thinking about the vision, and the Spirit said to him, Look, three men are searching for you. Now get up and go with them, for I have sent them. So Peter is like, Okay, I, you know, what do you say to do, God? I'll go do. So Peter went down, and he went to Cornelius' house, which Cornelius was a, a Gentile. And Jews don't get along with Gentiles. But God said, go to his house. So he went there. And, and there's a big assembly. And Cornelius invited him in. And so he said, God has shown me that I would not call anyone profane or unclean. So in the past, they wouldn't get along with Gentiles. God was using this vision to show Peter that the Gentiles weren't unclean. It was okay to go in and eat their food and be with them. So that's what he did. And he'd eat with them and he stayed with them and they asked him to speak. Oh, okay, so he's there and they've got this message. So what was the message God was sending to Peter? What was the message God was sending to Peter? Was it about food? Or was it about people? 
people? Both? It's just a new covenant now, right? Because yes. So, maybe that's kind of maybe some of that. so as the church is growing, the church is, was born after Pentecost, and it's growing, they've got to figure out how to blend the Jewish tradition of 1,500 years with Christianity. And the Jews wanted the Christians to all be like Jews. And Paul said, no, that's not what God intends. So you don't have to be like Jews. And so that was the argument. And now with Peter having this vision, the argument goes to Paul's side or, or God makes it clear to Peter that this is what I intend. So uh, Peter began to speak to the Gentiles now gathered at Cornelius' house. And he says, I truly understand that God shows no partiality. So he went ahead and preached to them and they, the, the, uh, Gentiles had the Holy Spirit poured out on them. And they could tell that the Holy Spirit was on there and they're praising God and doing all these things. And the, the people with Peter were going, wait a minute, we've never seen anything like this before. What is going on? And Peter says, it's obvious the Holy Spirit is being poured out on them. Is there any reason we can't baptize them? And they, they said no. So they baptized them. And Peter stayed with them for several days. So when Peter went back to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, why did you go to the uncircumcised men and eat with them? And then Peter had to explain to them what happened. And then a little later in Acts, if then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? And God has given the, even the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. So now that's what happened in Acts chapter 10 and 11. And this is before Galatians. Paul went to the, the area of Galatians and preached to them and they, they accepted Christ. And then the, the Jewish people came and said, oh, you've got to be you got to be Jews. And Paul went back and he sat down with Peter. And, and Peter had this experience. And they sat down in Acts chapter 15 and, and worked it out. And um, everything was kosher, so to speak. Everything was good. The Gentiles didn't have to be Jews. But Peter went back to Antioch and he would eat with them and have all kind of fun with the Gentiles. But the Jewish tradition people came and said, wait a minute, you can't do this. So they challenged him. And Peter, being wishy-washy, backed down. He said, okay, I won't associate with them anymore. And now we're up to where Galatians is today. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood self-condemned for until certain people came from James or the Jews. He used to eat with the Gentiles, but after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. So Peter would have been considered the chief of the apostles at that time. And this passage effectively uh, refutes the notion that Peter was infallible. He, he may have been a leader, but he still made a lot of mistakes. Paul goes on to say, But when I saw that they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? So, because of what happened in Acts chapter 10, which we looked at a minute ago, um, Peter was backsliding, or before that he was eating, I mean, he was eating their food because of Acts chapter 10, but after the Judaizers came, he refused to eat with them, 
And he affirmed implicitly that though believers in Christ, they were still to him common and unclean. That the Mosaic rites imparted a higher sanctity than the righteousness of faith. And that was contradicting Paul's message. This is Paul now talking to Peter, basically. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus. And we have come to believe in Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. So the Jews had had the, the law for basically 1,500 years. And they weren't able to keep the law. It would be a folly for the Gentiles to turn from grace and try to follow the law, especially since the law hadn't saved the Jews. The law was given to reveal sin, not to save from sin. So the law lets you know that you were breaking it, basically. You couldn't follow all the laws. And Paul's not saying that the law is bad, because in, in Romans he wrote, so the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. So the law still has an important role to play in the life of Christians. One, the law guards us from sin by giving us standards for behavior. It convicts us of sin, leaving us the opportunity to get in tune with God by asking his forgiveness. And it drives us to trust in the sufficiency of Christ because we can never keep the Ten Commandments perfectly. So is anybody here that, that has never broken a commandment? Got to be careful here. We don't want lightning to strike. Paul goes on, But if in our efforts to be justified in Christ we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. So I got to figure out what this verse means, see, so I can tell you, and you probably know better than that, especially Dwayne, he knows everything. But the sense of this verse seems to be, since the Jew had to forsake the law in order to be justified by Christ and therefore take his place as a sinner, is Christ the one that makes a Jew a sinner? And Paul's answer is, of course not. The Jew, like the Gentile, was a sinner by nature. He could not be justified by the law. The same thought was given by Peter in his address before the great council in Jerusalem. So now this is back to Acts chapter 15, where Peter had been convinced that Paul was right. Now therefore, you are, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we had been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. So this is Peter talking in Acts chapter 15, and it's after this that he went to the Antioch and, wouldn't, and, and started eating with the Gentiles, and then he didn't. So Peter was a pretty confused guy. So Paul goes on to say, but if I build up again the very thing that I tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. So after the Cornelius uh, incident, with the, bread, the sheets and the food. Uh, Peter had abandoned the whole legal system for faith in Christ. That it's not the law, but it's faith in Christ. Now, by refusing to eat with Gentiles, he is returning to the law. In doing so, he proves that he is the one that is wrong. Deuteronomy, I'm jumping around here, I know. Deuteronomy Chapter 27, verses 26, shows that under the legal system, eventually God would have to destroy all the Israelites. Cursed be anyone who does not uphold the words of this law by observing them. That's in Deuteronomy. But God gave the Jews, the Israelites, the sacrificial system. Five sacrifices but the sacrifices was a temporary reprieve all of the sacrifices were doing was pointing to Christ and they they should have realized it's hard for us to see that because we're not 
Jewish in background, but they would see that. Hebrews 10 through 3, but in these sacrifices there is a reminder of sin year after year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And Paul goes on, for through the law I died to the law so that I might live to Christ, to God. I have been crucified with Christ. So the penalty for breaking the law is death. Paul is saying, as a sinner, I had broken the law, therefore it condemned me to die. But Christ paid the penalty of the broken law for me by dying in my place. He died to the law in the sense that he met all its righteous demands. Therefore, in Christ, I too have died to the law. The law could never produce a holy life. God never intended that it should produce a holy life. Because we cannot keep God's laws perfectly. Fortunately, God has provided a way of salvation that depends on Jesus Christ, not on our own efforts. Even though we know this truth, we must guard against the temptation of using service, good works, charitable giving, or any other efforts as a substitute for faith. What did I just say? What does that mean to you? Don't use service, charitable good works, or other efforts as a substitute for faith. We're not saved by works. Does that mean we can't do works? <laughs> Very good. Thank you. I just want to, I'm going to say that, but where I would get that out. Does grace mean that a believer is at liberty to break the Ten Commandments all he wants? Donna's shaking her head no. At least somebody gets something right. Does grace allow us to sin, you know, willy-nilly because grace is so great? No. We live a holy life not through fear of the law, but out of love for the one who died for us. Christians who desire to be under the law as a pattern for behavior do not realize that this places them under its curse. They cannot touch the law in one point without being responsible to keep it completely. So if you think that what you do or what you eat or how you act is what saves you, you're lost. It's what Christ did. And that's something that it's really tough to get past because it's, we're so used to wanting to do something. Paul says, It is no longer I live who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the God, Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So as believers, we don't cease to be an individual with personality. What happens is we have a change of heart. He died for me so that from now on he might be able to live with his life in me, the life which I now live in his, this human body. I live by faith in the Son of God. Faith means reliance or dependence. The Christian lives by continual dependence on Christ, by yielding to him, by allowing Christ to live his life in him. Thus the believer's rule of life is Christ and not the law. It's not a matter of striving, but of trusting. He lives a holy life, not out of fear of punishment, but out of love for the Son of God, who loved us and gave his life for us. In our daily life, we must regularly crucify our sinful desires that keep us from knowing and following Christ. Luke 9 23, 25, then he said to them all, if any want to become my followers, let them de deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. What does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves? But the focus of Christianity is not dying, but living. 
with Christ in us, we are free to grow into Christ likeness. That's Romans 8, 29. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be firstborn within a large family. So I had this revelation this morning. I thought I'd better check with Dwayne because he knows everything, you know. So if I invite Christ into my heart, that gives me access to the Holy Spirit. If I don't invite Christ into my heart, the Holy Spirit might act in my life, but I don't have direct access. Does that make sense? The Holy Spirit, we've, we've talked about the Holy Spirit acting in several times, and it's so hard for us to get in tune with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that small, still small voice that's hard for us to tune into, to listen to, because we've got so much other stuff going on in our lives. When we invite Christ into our hearts, now we can tune in to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit can tell us what to think, what to say, what to do. Dwayne, you look like you're ready to say something. Well, you know, it's interesting. When you do a sermon, people pick up little nuggets of gold. It may not be why you was intending to share, but when you talked about uh, Peter, how long to eat four foot of animals, reptiles, and birds. If we see he's in the world today, he would use Romans 12 saying, we would be in the world, not of the world. So in his mind, he would say, why can't eat that? Because that'd be out of the world. So the solution would be, read and pray, and God will give you the answer, because God gave Peter the answer to what he was fighting. So I just... It has nothing to do with what the direction he's going. But as soon as you said that, I thought, well, if, he, if this happened today, we could say, well, we're to be in the world, not other world. And if I ate that food, I'd be of the world. But God says, no, you're not of the world. I changed things. If that makes sense. Yeah, and now I'm more confused. No. <laughs> Other with wisdom have more more wisdom than I do. Yes. Right. Yeah, you're not allowed to have shrimp. I I know several shrimp lovers around. So, you can not eat shrimp because you don't like it or that you, because uh, you want, don't want to break the law or you can not eat sh or you can eat shrimp and, and not break the law because what happened to Peter but if you don't eat it because you don't want to break the law then you're you're going back to kind of relying on the law and that's what Paul is saying don't rely on on the law. Don't think the law. So it's Christ that saves you. And now you might still get sick if you eat shrimp. But it's not a sickness unto death. Hopefully. <laughs> no. Is that confusing enough? Are we allowed to eat shrimp or not? Are we allowed to eat shrimp or not? <laughs> Kevin? As long as you put lemon on it? So Kevin and I had this discussion, and you, I mean, there might be, uh, the God told the Jews, don't eat shrimp, don't eat pork. Now, a lot, of, a lot of people think that God said that because they didn't know how to cook properly, and it's very easy to get sick, uh, trichinosis, off of pork. But God had specific reasons why not having to do with sickness. I mean, that, that is true, but it got, God was trying to mold the Jews in a certain direction. But Christ gives us a different freedom. And the molding in, for us is to be like Christ, to have Christ in us. That's what we're supposed to be molded to. And if we're relying on parts of the law to get Christ in us, we're not fully relying on Christ.
And Christ wants us to fully take him in, not be, not be halfway. If we're halfway, then we're only halfway with Christ. So hopefully I didn't get myself in too much trouble there. I do not nullify the grace of God, for its justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. So a common misconception about the Old Testament way of salvation is that Jews were saved by keeping the law. But we know from the scripture that that is not true. Galatians 3.11, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the one who is righteous will live by faith. Now you might say, well, that's a New Testament passage, but Paul is quoting Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous live by faith. So how were the Jews saved? And are there zillions of Jews then that didn't know Christ, so they're not saved? How was Abraham saved? Go back to Abraham. Pardon? By faith. Abraham was saved by faith because he really, and this is another verse out of the Bible, I didn't put it on the screen. Abraham believed God and that's what saved him. So all the Jews that believe God and, and theoretically are saved by their faith. Now, Gentiles, we got a different direction. We got Christ, and that's the only way we can be saved is through Christ. But it's faith in Christ. Abraham had faith in God. And of course, Abraham is before the law. The law came 500 years or 1,000 years after Abraham. So you can be saved without the law by faith. And we can be saved by faith in Christ. If there had been any other way to save sinners, then God would have used that method. The only way that an infinite God could save you and I was to send his son to die. When man tries to earn it by something we can do, we're making what Christ did void. It is no longer by grace if we deserve it or earn it by something we did. Clow, who's a theologian, says, the deepest heresy of all, which corrupts churches, leavens creeds with folly, and swells our human hearts with pride, is salvation by works. John Ruskin writes, the root of every schism and heresy has been the effort to earn salvation rather than receive it. Preaching is ineffective when it calls men to work for God rather than to behold God working for them. Okay, so Jill and Wayne, I asked this question at the end. You've heard all this. What insights have you picked up from today? What are you going to take home with you? What's going to affect your life from what we said this morning? Any insights anybody has to share? Rebecca. So when you're led to do these works, it's not you doing them just to show how good you are. It's Christ, your faith in Christ, and Christ leading you through faith to do the works. Correct. So it doesn't mean we don't do works. But your faith is in Christ, and you do the works because you love Christ. And let's talk about feeding the hungry. Christ loves the hungry. We're not doing it because we love the hungry, because we'll never do it. When it'll kill us. We're doing it because we love Christ, and Christ says, feed the hungry. And so you're not working for them, you're working for Christ. Does that make sense? You're working it, you're doing it because of your love for Christ. Other insights people have. 
or you want to argue with, you can argue with me too. That's all right too. Okay, so I got four or five insights. One, be consistent with your beliefs. Check with the word rather than Google or men. So, know what you believe and don't let what people tell you affect. You might, you might hear them and then go back and say, I've got to research this. And but go back and see what the word says rather than rely totally on what people say. Because we are like Peter. Peter, Peter we are not infallible. We make mistakes. Two, the law has a purpose. The law has a purpose. It helps us see the need for grace. Because we can't, can't fulfill law. How many people have driven and not ever exceeded the speed limit? I know Dwayne probably you know, does that, but never. never. Okay. The law didn't save the Jews. The law won't save us. Uh, four, we need Christ first, then we follow the law. Not out of fear, but out of love. What did Christ say about the law? Anybody remember what Christ said about the law? He, came, he didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill it. So now we've got to figure out what that means. It means the law is still there for us. But the people of Jesus' time didn't understand the law. Like this, the Pharisees had these, all these crazy rules about the Sabbath, which wasn't at all what God intended. So is the Sabbath still important to us, for God and us? In construction, sometimes they, the job gets behind and they say, okay, everybody's got to work on Saturdays. Sometimes they say everybody's got to work on Sundays. And, and it's crazy stupid because if you work, you can work 50, 60, 70 hours a week. But after a, a week or so of that, you're only working 40 hours. <laughs> I mean, you may be there, but the work you're getting done is only like 40 hours a week. So it's, now I know that there are people that have to work on Saturdays and Sundays, and that's a different case. Because if you have to work on Saturdays and Sundays, you need to find another day to take off. But there's a reason God made those laws. And if you just constantly go, 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 and don't take a break with God, you'll fall apart. Especially your faith. Can you say, Ken, I'm thinking of Peter now, don't let your faith be a robot. don't let your faith be a roadblock to share your faith. Does that make sense? Don't let your faith be a roadblock. In other words, the things we believe in, but we've got to make sure that the people we minister for evangelize to have done the same thing with us. So we can't let our belief system prevent us from sharing the faith. Does that, does that make sense? No, not at all. <laughs> we gotta be we gotta be careful how we share our faith. Uh, and and a, a big one would be not emphasize how bad a sinner somebody is. Like Ray, I could point at Ray and say how bad he is. Mm -hmm. And because I know that you broke this law, this law, this law. And first of all, that's not going to get you anywhere. But um, that that is opposite of what Paul's saying. What you got to do is say, okay, Ray, I know you're not perfect. But Christ died for you whatever you've done, and he'll take your imperfectness away and give you a chance for a new life. Now, since Ray's almost perfect, that don't matter to him. For, for, but for Lawrence, he's saying, wow, wow, you put all that stuff behind me aside, and now I'm free to, and to grow in you and to be one with you? How about that? You know, I can't believe it. But that is what 
Christ does. Here's an example. At work, I was in class, they went to sports clubs. They drank beer. I didn't. I could have said, well, I just don't participate in drinking beer. I'm not going to go with you. That's what I'm saying. Sometimes you don't let your belief become a roadblock because I could have, in all those times, said, you know, I don't drink beer or alcohol. I'm not going with you. I'll see you later. Or you can go and be with them, yet stay in your own timelines, in your belief system. Yeah. I guess that's what I'm saying. And my dad would always go to these meetings where everybody was drinking and he'd get a ginger ale for that very thing. Yeah, I, I can understand that. You've got to meet people. You've got to meet people and be to a certain degree on their Yeah. Yeah. And also, if you're, if you're saying you can't say that you're a big center, if you want to, you can say, you know, I'm a center too. Yeah. Go from there. We said in, in, in Sunday school downstairs, we said the worst thing you could do is go up and tell somebody you're a Christian because you're assaulting them from the very beginning. And, and, and Bruce, I think, said he learned as a child, don't tell people you're a Christian. If somebody asks you if you're a Christian, say, well, ask my neighbor. See what he says. Don't, don't ask me, but look at my life. So in evangelism, you don't want to assault somebody or tell them how wrong they are because they probably know it. Or if they don't know it, it's, it's, that's not the problem. What they need is a different perspective on life, and that's what we can bring people is a different perspective. Uh, okay, my last insight was having Christ living us in us gives us access to the Holy Spirit. So we, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit. How do you know what the Holy Spirit is saying? Well, the more you know Christ, the more better chance you'll have, and what Christ thought, the better ha chance you'll have of listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying at a certain time. And the more you live, you try to put aside, and we're going to get this later in Galatians, you put aside those not so Christ-like parts of your life and bring in what Christ is teaching, the more that you're going to be able to hear what the Spirit is saying. And when you, when you try to evangelize them and you try to be with people, if you pray to Christ while you're talking to somebody, and you can do this, I've done that, you say, oh, they're asking me a hard question, Christ, what do I say? Christ will give you the words. And... It might be to not answer the question, but to shut up and say, I need to pray about this and get back with you. Because what you're asking is, is too hard right now. Or it might be that you'll have a, an answer, but if you try to give them a slick answer, that's probably going to stop the conversation. And what you want is the conversation. When we go to prison and we're dealing with the prisoners, we don't try to fix them because we know that's going to be useless. And even if they make a jailhouse conversion right then and there, it's probably not going to stick. What we want them to do is be able to talk with each other, the, the prisoners, talk with each other and continue in our program, which goes every week. And that is where their faith can grow by the fact that they can come back and ask the questions later when they better understand what it means. Okay. Let's pray. God, we have gotten into a lot this morning, and there's a bunch of it we don't understand. And when we don't know, understand, God, how what Christ did on the cross can totally save us without anything we did, but your word says it is so. Help us live into your word in our lives and hearts and minds and souls to have a change come over us that then we can have a positive effect on the world.
In Jesus' name, amen. Our last song is Blessed Assurance. Jill and Wayne, do you want to give us a quick update on uh, Nate and Ivy? I forgot to ask that. I, I really appreciate them sending out their newsletter. He's, he's got to turn it back there. Okay, uh, right at the moment, they, uh, they took a few days and, and have been traveling, and they've been on a little vacation, so they're, they're coming back. Uh, so I, I'm anxious to hear you know, where they've been and what they've done. Uh, but they're, they're especially excited because uh, Pleasant View Missionary is taking a mission trip to Thailand to spend some time with them. And right now, downstairs in our bedroom, we've got homeschooling supplies on our bed for for the eighth grade uh, which is Karis is going into eighth grade so they're going to transport that and get that there for them uh, and uh, we're we're kind of getting helping them prepare for that and, and get that stuff delivered um, but they uh, they're having a good uh, a good experience in Thailand. I think it's it's very much home to them and uh they they've got deep roots there and um I I feel like they really like what they're doing. Uh, I think you're probably familiar with the audio Bible program that they do and that's going very well. Uh, a lot of interest in that. Um their main church is a lot of Western people, it's on the campus at the university, but they also have very, very close ties to the local church. It's about a block away, that's a Thai church. And uh, they're still continuing to work with them a lot. Uh, they have students coming in, uh, and their main thing, they're not translators per se, they are more coordinators for getting the people in to get their education and to, so they can go back and translate it into their own language. Uh, a lot of the people come, or not a lot of them, but several of them from Myanmar, uh, 
and that is a real mess right there right now. Um, there's civil war there, and people are being drafted by both sides, the government side and the rebel side. Uh, they've had students that uh, they're worried about getting out of the country to come, and then their families, their villages being burned, and you know, it's a nasty situation. They're safe, they don't have that, that problem, but they're dealing with it indirectly through their students. So I, I really appreciate their newsletter that they send out, and we'll be, we put it in our newsletter, so I hope that's all right. And uh, we'll, you'll be getting that after this weekend. Uh, the people here will be getting that in our newsletter. But um, when we talk about uh, works and faith, uh, Ivy is, is uh, Jill and uh, Wayne's daughter. And so uh, we're very pleased to have you be here this morning to give us that update. Um, but they're doing this out of their love for Christ. It's not because they think they, they can fix the world on their own. They rely on Christ for everything they do, and uh, which is what we need to work at being able to do in our lives. So go in Christ. Amen.